I don't think we've ever received any meaningful news over the last 11 or so years that I've been here ever on any major unprecedented unforeseeable launch that has said alert in it never it, it's always just like this like random thing it's like oh like well, whoever launches this amazing new thing you were never expecting to do and then that's it but it's like this like this but when two idiots stand in front of a pink wall it's an alert greetings and welcome to this week's upload to watch weekly it's going to be a fun one where mm, many of us haven't had enough sleep. Uh, many of us are in hotel rooms. It's going to be dead ropey. But Ariel and Ripley are in their usual places. Ariel in his nice studio and Ripley in front of the Great Wall of Ripley. So let's say hello to David first of all. David, good morning. Where are you? And what are you doing wherever you are? Hey, good morning. I'm in Nosh Hotel looking at some pieces to be launched right around Watches and Wonders, but not at Watches and Wonders. So that should give you a hint. Uh -huh. The great coordination of the Swiss watch industry strikes again in terms of yes. release schedules. Good, mm -hmm. good. Uh, Ripley, how are you this morning? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, just finished writing up an article for a watch that comes out tomorrow. Nothing to do with watches and wonders or anything Swiss, so all good things. Excellent. And Ariel, are you well slept and well kept this morning? I'm still nursing some uh, some jet lag, but um, <laughs> I have calls tonight until three in the morning. I have a call tomorrow at five in the morning. Time zones mean nothing to me. Yeah, uh, one of these is you are going to have to consider whether really the west coast of America is really where you should be living. Maybe, maybe you should move slightly further east, but that would be helpful. I'm a global citizen. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I'm currently in Eindhoven for no good reason that I can actually think of, but I may get the chance to go into Amsterdam later on today and actually have a wander and see if I can get into any particular watch trouble. But we have some great watch trouble to start. David's not going to be here for the whole show, but he is certainly going to be here to talk about his article, incredibly well-timed, grinding gears, stop. Media alerts for celebrities invisibly wearing watches they were told to wear. David, it's like grinding gears. Let's hear some gears ground. <laughs> well, I mean, they've been grinding for years before I wrote this. I didn't write this on a whim. <laughs> uh, it's been, I was, I've been tracking this trend for quite some time. And I thought, well, maybe this will die down. But the opposite of that happened. And it just picked up and kept on picking up. And it, it reached a point where I was like, well, you know, it, it turned into uh, you know it, it got to a point where certain brands would only send me media alerts for people wearing their watches celebrities uh, paid ambassadors wearing their watches as opposed to uh you know them launching new watches or you know any watchmaking technologies or whatever uh and so i figured you know maybe they should just simply stop doing that and focus on making watches a little bit more yes i mean this kind of goes into two camps there's the camp of the watch brand that sends you a media alert for mm -hmm. something that they've actually organized or paid for. And then there's the brands, <coughs> Panerai, who send you a media alert because they happen to have spotted what somebody else has spotted on the internet, which is somebody wearing their watch. So they've decided to tell everybody about it, even though there's no financial relationship, no relationship at all, just is a thing that's happened. And so not only as you touch on in your article, do you get the media alert? But the you can't actually use this photograph that we're sending you anyway because it doesn't belong to us. Uh, so you can Yeah, that's, the, that's one of the lowest of, low points Thanks for all telling this. us about this, but you can't actually do anything with it. Well, why are you telling me about it then? Because you're I checked. There uh -huh. is this picture of these two, um, well, um, um, hmm, I don't know how I say this, interestingly dressed gentleman in front of a uh -huh. pink wall with Victoria's Secret fitting on it. And uh -huh. the cheapest price to obtain that amazing picture from uh, from Getty Images was 450 euros. <laughs> so if you wanted to say, on behalf of this brand, that two guys, random, I don't know who, were wearing a titanium something or another uh, uh -huh. in this completely meaningless scenario, then, the, you know, they would be like, sure, pay 450 euros for the privilege. I was like, well, no, that's not happening. I didn't even Outrage. realize that, that they wanted us to pay for images to cover this. That's really adding insult to injuries. <laughs> okay. David, I have, yeah. I have a question for you. What if these emails were phrased a little bit differently rather than the sort of like, um, you know, 
high alert, you must do something now, like breaking news. It was just like a digest of every once in a while saying, here's some famous people wearing our watches. If you care to see what they look like on them, would that soften the blow at all? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it would. I, I, I like that direction. I think if instead media alert would say, we apologize, and then it, <laughs> it was say whatever it was going to say, our sincerest <laughs> apologies, celebrity wears our watch on red carpet. You probably don't care about this, but here it is anyway. And maybe like a quarterly digest, and then I would have to do it just one time every three months. <laughs> because there's not as much urgency when there's a new product or pretty much anything yes. else. But if there's a celebrity that chose to wear their watch, not buy it, chose to wear it, there needs to be a whole host of members of the media alerted to this. Because if not, they might miss out on crucial information that the public wants to know. Yes. Yeah, exactly. My phone only (laughs) pings when I receive a media alert, so I can jump out of bed and write this up. I See, I don't think the audience always understands all of our complaints because, again, I, I said this in a comment on your article, but we have to act as gatekeepers, right? Like yeah. our position, uh, d- despite brands is <laughs> fighting us, but our position is you need to impress us first and then we'll act impressed in front of our audience. You can't just pay us or expect that you release news and we're going to get excited about it. You have to actually convince us. If you can't convince us, we sincerely doubt you'll be able to convince a lot of members of the public. Yet they don't seem to really want to play that game all the time. And when they don't, we have to sort of laugh because the idea that media just publishes what the brands want is what led most other media to the dismal place that they are today. I think we need to introduce oh, yeah. like a, 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 not a paid experience. We're not charged for it, but you know, if you want to experience what it's like, if you're thinking like David, that just sounds like such a stupid complaint. There's that's what are we complaining about? You know, you're in New Chatel and seeing all these nice watches. Well, I think, I think what we need to do is you need to like send your email address to podcasts at a blog to watch.com. And what we'll do is we'll add your email address to like an auto forward so that every time okay. an email hits our account that says media alert, it will automatically forward it so that you can get the full watch journalist experience. It's something that no other website or blog or podcast offers. Oh, if you want geez. to experience what it's like being a watch journalist, and you too can just have your inbox. We, well, we can't, we can't do that because of the embargoes. Level. We can't ah. do that because of the embargoes. <laughs> so maybe we can just start, ease it in, where it's like, if you really care about the celebrities... Embargoes media alert. <laughs> well, no, no, if you, if you really... No, for, for the people, like, look, hey, look, we personally don't care about what celebrities are wearing what watch, but if for those of the community who do, reach out, and we will forward you every single one of those emails, which none of those are <laughs> under embargo. So, like, if you honestly yeah. do care, if you do care, I will personally make it my mission to make sure you receive every single one of these. Excellent. Ripley is just going to and then, I, and then I won't stop. And then I won't stop. There's no way to opt out. I will continue this. <laughs> yeah. You, you will have to burn your email address. I don't think we've ever received any meaningful news over the last 11 or so years that I've been here ever on any major unprecedented <laughs> unforeseeable launch that had said alert in it never it, it's always <laughs> just like this like random thing it's like oh like well whoever launches this amazing new thing you were never expecting to do and then that's it but it's like this like this but when two I have a theory. idiots stand in front of a pink wall it's an alert <laughs> basically it is I mean I guess I should be alerted we usually like to claim that the media that covers this type of stuff is superficial. Maybe they're also dumb and they need to have an email that says <laughs> alert. Otherwise, they just won't pay attention. Yeah. You know, this email yeah. is for you to pay attention to. Otherwise, they'll just delete it. <laughs> the interesting thing is, like, yeah. I do understand why they're doing it because it is a very specific type of brand where it's the one that is already very prominent within the watch industry and they're trying to gain that traction with a more mainstream audience. Uh, so I understand why the, this, these these communica- really. I, I, I've seen their ad <laughs> on a plane once or twice. So like, you know, I mean, yeah, kind of. They're trying to get there, and so I, I think, you know, they're not really they're they shouldn't be talking to us. What they what these things what these are are more of the general fashion industry type of messaging. And so I totally understand why brands like Omega, who that's as big as you can get in the watch industry, now it's about garnering more of a mainstream 
uh, audience if you're trying to grow in a meaningful manner. So I, but this I, can't speak well about mainstream media. I mean, like I get that not all media no, is watch no, media. No, no, but no, like, no. I mean, who cares I about this? I, I mean, like I, there's a reason Where I write about news? watches and not fashion. I don't understand the fashion industry, but that's how it operates. So I kind of understand why it's happening. But, but, but the fact that, that the... we're receiving the communications is where I think there's the disconnect. We've met good fashion editors that write about watches from a fashion perspective. Like, is it really news that celebrities wore something? Like, I understand that people care, but like, is that news? Is their entire websites dedicated to what celebrities were paid to wear? Who is covering this as though it's newsworthy? I wonder whether we're missing a trick here, and actually, I need to take my idea for a bigger walk. Possibly, maybe we're not the only industry that suffers this, and maybe what is we need to do is gang up with like the car industry and like the electronics industry sports equipment and have like a repository where anyone that gets an email from any brand or organization that has the phrase media alert on it can all be auto forwarded to some AI bot and it can just go and sit over there nice and neatly in a corner and those that want it can go and find it and then the rest of us can just sit here and actually speak about but well, i mean we can't really say we speak about things that matter because none of this really matters but you know i i, I think maybe maybe this is the tip of the iceberg it's what we're experiencing and, and there's some more there to be done i i do also particularly like the media alerts that completely fail and we did get one recently about a certain uh any ted lasso fans between the three of you no ted lasso don't have Everybody. apple so i phil, hear good things i don't have apple but hear good things so phil dunster was a Media alerted to us, I believe, by a certain brand that begins with what an O. What was the alert, Rick? In... What was it? The I alert was that he was going to be wearing an Omega watch. Going to be? Great. Going to be wearing an Omega watch. Unfortunately, the photograph that then circulated at the, I think it was the Screen Actors Guild Awards, he was wearing an IWC. So, yeah, brands so media alerting news. <laughs> to give other yeah. brands. <laughs> publicity by mistake. I know. Explain to us just a bit of background, not so much in the media alert, but how some of these people end up wearing the watches. Because I think some folk don't get that there is or isn't a financial thing at play here, and that sometimes there is, and most of the time, it's just there's a big table of watches and you pick up yeah, what you want, yeah. you give it back at the end of the evening. There, there's a few situations going on. Uh, I'll tell you what the rarest situations are. Somebody like actually being paid a whole host of money to wear these things. That's, that's quite rare. A little bit less rare is that they're wearing their own watch. Um, that's a little bit rare. And, and oftentimes that's for security purposes because people who have very expensive things don't really want people to take a bunch of pictures of it on them because it's a, it becomes a theft issue. So what happens most of the time, if you're a celebrity and you're going to an awards show, you have all these options of basically loaning clothing and accessories. And they have these things, uh, especially here in Los Angeles, they call them style suites. And what you would do in the day, literally just the days before, even the hours before the show is you would walk in there and there would be a bunch of different companies that have clothes and accessories shoes watches jewelry whatever and you'd stroll around and you'd see like oh do i like this do we have sort of like a good good chemistry going on you're chatting with the rep and you just sort of decide uh what you like sometimes the celebrity isn't there at all it's just a stylist sometimes the celebrity is like i know that brand or um i'd like to be there a lot of them is i'd love to be their ambassador or, or i if, if this looks good on me will you pay me next time right because they they shop for these uh ambassadorships and things like that so most of the time um it's a loan once in a while they'll be gifted but that's actually relatively uncommon unless it's like a really impressive celebrity um especially with the expensive jewelry like i don't care if you're a famous actress you're not getting a million dollar necklace um so uh, these people wear it and then the brand style suites are like <laughs> notoriously like on them right after the show, like, ah, give me the watch back <laughs> or like a few days later. Um, and that's how a lot of it gets done. And it's really just an ability for celebrities to feel like they can look good in a highly pub publicized place. Um, and in exchange for having these style suites, which are not very expensive, but there's some costs associated with having your products there and having reps, brands just try to, you know, make the most out of the selections that people make. But I guess what we're laughing about is they're so sensational about it, right? They could be so much more elegant and slick. And to us, 
there's no validation here that these are good watches. There's no validation here that people who know nice things are choosing them. There's no validation here that these are well-made or collectible or valuable or, or sporty, whatever. It's just, hey, uh, a, fa a famous person's wearing it. So, you know, I, there is a little bit of value, as Rick said, but um, that's, that's essentially, from my understanding, how, how most of it works in the background. Well, there is one, there is one to add one shard of slight legitimacy to it. Um, I knew, I know a few stylists and sometimes what happens is they work I directly with the, with, oh yes, I've dressed by every single one of them as is my wall. <laughs> uh, but, they, but the, it, what happens is they, one, uh, the stylist might work, dress several celebrities and they also might, um, work with one or multiple brands. And there sometimes might be a small monetary transaction, but others times there's not, it's not uh, a monetary transaction, but rather that the brand or brands are offering this uh, celebrity stylist access to their pieces. Um, and if they like them, they can, you know, put them in front of the celebrity that they're dressing as they kind of put their outfit together. A lot of these celebrities don't fully dress themselves, especially not for high profile events. And so in these instances, you know, uh, it, in some rare instances, they might have an IWC, an Omega, and something on the table because the stylist works with these three brands. No one's really being paid for it, but the guy wanted the blue suit and it was the, you know, the Omega with the blue dial. And so the IWC didn't get worn or vice versa. And so sometimes there is a decision being made, um, but often it can just be the stylist that works with the brand directly. And then it's their relationships with the people that they kind of curate a few different uh, watches from their current collection that they would be inclined to pair with the other outfits they have for their clients. And so there's sort of that that sometimes happens. But that's when it's, you know, probably on the most legitimate levels. And I think the brand just wants to trumpet that they beat out the one or two other brands that might have been, you know, in consideration. But often it's not based on the watch. It's literally based on everything else with the outfit that, you know, that ends up tying it together if there is a choice. Maybe we need to lean into this. And actually, we should be attending these events and shouting over onto the red car. Tell us about your IWC. What do you think of that Rolex you're wearing? And just see if, you know, you know that, that kind of guerrilla, bit of guerrilla well, journalism. I've been on those red carpets. You do not want to do that, Rick. <laughs> no, but I'll cover the Oscars. If we can get a, a blog to watch Oscars passes for everyone, I think we can make an exception to the rule and once a year turn out to, you know, the, there. Okay, Ripley, if you want to chase them around and get their attention and then try to act like you really think they want to talk about their watch, I'll, I, will wa I will film you doing that. I am here for it. Look, I I, I, I won't be the biggest. Trailman. I won't be the biggest uh, ass on that night. I guess. Did <laughs> <laughs> it? Uh, you need to. We need to get you like a portable wall, like a, a little square of wall on wheels that we can put in behind you as you move around the red carpet line, Ripley, just to keep. That's right. Keep distinguish the whole yourself. The celebrity. Just distinguish yourself. This man's got a portable wall with him. Media alert. Man I has mean, portable they wall. They do. Red carpet events do have a portable wall. That step and repeat thing they set up in front of <laughs> the red right. carpet. This is mine. I went organic. <laughs> Ripley's shirt should just say media alert on it. Oh, now there's a range of. Sh David, get right onto that for the blog to watch shop. <laughs> media <Happy too>. alert. <laughs> Walking media alert. <laughs> Good stuff, David. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to leave us soon. So give us yes. a give us a summary. Final thoughts on this. Yeah, it's it's not that I, I disapprove of the whole thing or, or or the concept of brands paying ambassadors and celebrities and such. I don't think that that is the end of the world. Actually, I, I say in the article that uh, it, it's only right because a lot of people see, you know, or encounter a nice watch for the first time on the wrist of a celebrity they care about. That happens, you know. So so I'm not saying that this is altogether a bad thing. I'm just saying that the it's so off balance for some of the brands at this point uh, that it's, it's just bad. You know, I, I should not be receiving 10 emails of this nature and then maybe one or maybe not even one that is linked to actual watches and actual watchmaking. I think that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, and I don't want to see this uh, continue and get worse. I would love for these brands to return to communicating on watches and watchmaking just a little bit more. It's just obnoxious at the end of the day. And for us that live and yeah. breathe this every day, we want less yeah. obnoxious things in our face.
Indeed, except yes. for David, obviously. So if you're a small micro brand, then feel free to send your media alert to David at blogtowatch.com. Just add your own to your list. He wants to know when <laughs> anyone's wearing your watch, not just celebrities. Anyone just is wearing anyone, your watch, tell David. Any photos Let's be honest, for a micro brand, it's a big deal if anyone's wearing their watch. <laughs> They're like, hey, somebody's wearing your watch. <laughs> we, we, the most random media alert that we can think of. I don't even know who this person is. I don't even know who this watch brand is. Is this actually watch? watch? But you see, that makes me happy. That's cool. Well, uh, prizes for anyone that manages to send David a cool media alert, and we'll give you some publicity. We'll actually talk about your cool media alert if you manage to create or one. not, or not. Yeah. Good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> see you guys. Cheers. Yeah, cheers, everyone. I gotta bounce, Later, take David. some pictures of your watches. I'll see you next Enjoy. week. Enjoy. Great stuff. So David's away, which means now means we can talk about him. Anyway, <laughs> a media alert that did drop this week, or some uh, they did their usual trail which then everybody guessed what it was. And then there was various levels of disappointment uh, upon its actual release was a new moon watch from Omega, the Omega Speedmaster moon watch with a white lacquered dial. Uh, gentlemen, was this media alert worthy in any way, shape or form? Another Speedmaster, just this time a white one? Sounds like a good time to play Guess the Price. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well... <laughs> oh. It is. I mean, if it was any other Speedmaster, I would say, Meh. but I mean, now you would have a core collection white dial moon watch. The fact that this didn't already exist in a company that has 100,000 current production SKUs, <laughs> absolutely mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. If someone <laughs> said to me, Omega's most famous watch is the moon watch. Yes, it'd be, yeah. yeah. What are the two most popular dial colors? Uh, black and white. And one of those didn't exist? I'm shocked. So that is a media alert. It's a legitimate, it's a great looking watch. And it also shocking that it didn't exist. So it is a media alert. And now I wrote the article, so I can't guess the price, but Ariel, would you like to? As a point of reference, the black dial version, apples to apples on a bracelet is $8,000. Jesus. I remember not too long ago when I was trying to advocate to Omega that they keep the price of the Moonwatch Professional at three thousand dollars. At the time, it was about I think Big it was margin. just it was about four thousand something, and then they up they upped it to around five, and I was like, oh my god, for Hezolite. <laughs> well, this is a, this is the Sapphire Sandwich, I believe. So it's uh oh yeah, yes. they're, we we they're... we know thanks to Cassio that adds about a hundred dollars to the price. I'm guessing that's not what Omega's charging, <laughs> which still seems high when you think economies of scale i i, I know a micro can do a sapphire crystal on a 200 hundred dollar watch so i i'm not it wouldn't have been a hundred bucks without one um that it's over eight thousand dollars honestly makes me feel depressed this is supposed, supposed to be like i don't want to say entry level but the moon watch should be something that isn't so aspirational it should be something that mm. relatively soon into getting the watches you should be able to get that it's become such an expensive piece is confusing and dismaying to me a little bit. I, I love them. There's a lot of them. I sometimes feel that there's too much choice paralysis that goes on if you're trying to choose the Speedmaster for you. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid to hear that it's actually more than the black dial because that's preposterous. You'll only be a little bit depressed because it's only a little bit more expensive. Uh, $100 more expensive. Okay. So it's like a just because price. Yeah, I think the <laughs> rationale is the white lacquer um, is going to be a little bit more involved than just a black matte printing. And because the regular moon watch, you only get uh, one color of you know white printing. This year, I'll get the red name. So they got to stamp that balloon pad thing twice. So, you know. So now they're, now they're making ink precious too. <laughs> Will the Swiss stop at preciousizing nothing? Well, we, Mont Blanc's been doing precious resin in their pens for years. I know. That's why I'm laughing about it. You know, precious, <laughs> precious red ink. Um, so what is it? What are we talking about? Eighty six hundred dollars, eighty five hundred dollars? Like what is it? Eighty one hundred. Eighty one hundred dollars. Eighty one hundred dollars. Yeah. Eight for the wow. You know what the funny thing is? You know, Rick was talking about, you know, this economies of scale. They've amortized the cost of all R and D like how many decades ago now? <laughs> <laughs> well, not that long ago. This is the new one. So that 3861 only came out a handful of years ago. They're still... Yeah, but uh, isn't that kind of like a remake of an old movement as it is? 
no, no, that's the three, two, one. That's the oh. one where they just are pressing control C, control V, okay. but where they have the dedicated <laughs> facility. Now, why that one's so expensive is because they're all built. The whole watch is built by one guy. So you get like more of the craftsman side of it. They've made it needlessly hard. But, you know, that is the premium, premium Speedmaster. This is the new, new bees, knees, coaxial, anti-magnetic Moonwatch one. So it's manually wound. I think it's a cool watch. It is too rich for my taste. I bought a Speedmaster at for twenty two fifty. This was years ago, but it was I, the prices, like you said, they were getting above three grand new, and I was going, "Oh, this is getting this is getting a little rich for me." I like the watch, but once you start approaching that five grand threshold, a lot of other things come on the table. Um, but yeah, the fact that they're encroaching that five figure price point is getting is getting pretty high. I, I can't help but feeling like this is an exercise in making something like the Volkswagen Golf more and more and more expensive. Rather than make a better Volkswagen Golf, they're like, but people wanted to have solid gold seats, right? No, they don't. That's why there's other more expensive cars out there. Like, why does the Speedmaster need to be so uh, luxurious? I, I get Omega wants to make money. This is not a fact lost on any of us. But practically speaking... <laughs> Don't they have other watches that they can charge more money for? Like, shouldn't this just be like the good VW Golf that is a really well-made thing and not cheap, but why does it have to cost as much as a Mercedes E-Class? Well, I think that it, the thing, because it's their most, like their most famous model, like, and I think I've said this before about Omega, they're kind of, it's a, a blessing and a curse. The moon watch is legitimately one of the icons of horology. And it's a watch that even non-watch nerds know because it got to the moon first and all of that. So because of that, it is the Omega to own. If you're only going to own one Omega, unless you just love James Bond, it's the Speedmaster. Now, why that's a problem for them is it's like their entry level chronograph. So, you know, pretty much every other Speedmaster is more expensive than the classic Moonwatch, and that sort of pigeonholed them to the point where they do have to increase the price of that flagship offering, because it's like if the best, you know, not the best selling, but like the Volkswagen to own was the Jetta. No one even looked at the, like, the, you know, the, the Wolfsburg edition or the GLI version. <laughs> Like, you know, they were only about like base level no jet. I think I think an intervention is required. You have far too much knowledge of that kind of specification of Volkswagens for my liking. <laughs> uh, that's anyone that can rhyme off model numbers. I didn't know for this Volkswagen was another rabbit Jettas hole, Rick. I'm so sorry. Needs I, I... An intervention. <laughs> Media alert. <laughs> Look, it's I, I think the reason we're having this discussion is it, it it's a healthy debate. It's two different perspectives on the matter. Um, but I don't think that Speedmaster has to cost that much. I hear what you're saying, but I feel like this endly, endless road to just constantly increase costs uh, is biting themselves because consumers are clearly not that enthusiastic and they now, now have to do media alerts, right? Like, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think that it's, it's important to be stable. These brands always talk about the long-term way of thinking and stability. Well, the prices sure as hell aren't stable. Um, and I see that somebody like is the idea like buy a Speedmaster now before the price goes up. It's it's a very strange psychology, and it turns me away from the brand because I feel like the brand is thinking too much about their monetary needs and a lot less about the consumer experience. And if they're even having a good time, it just sort of makes people who are cost conscious just kind of want to look the other direction. So here we go. Give us a date by at which the first standard edition speedmaster so steel nothing special about it no limited edition generally available At what date is that gonna pass the ten thousand dollar mark give us a prediction and we'll check back so it's at eight thousand ish just now how no, long for that's for that's for the premium levels? sapphire sandwich i think it's it's quite a bit less <laughs> if you get the one with the hesalite crystal on like what how spray. much less now i want to know all right no we're gonna look this up there's a uh, it, it is quite a bit less. So before there used to be two different movements used in the Moonwatch. Those that had the uh, solid back got the 1861, which had a plastic brake and some pretty uh, bare bones decorated plates and bridges. Yeah, that's the, the one 18... everyone remembers. Yeah, the 1863 was the one they used in the Sapphire Sandwich models. And that one was cool because you had the metal brake, which no one wants to see some gray Delrin, even if it is self-lubricating. But then uh, you had the better decoration. It was the fancy version. Now they've done away with that. The 3861 is only done in one spec. So if you wanted to get the absolute basic 
Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Tesselite Crystal Metal Back on a strap, uh, that nylon fabric one, $6,600 US. It doesn't even come with a bracelet? Well, you can get the bracelet that co- that costs more. That's seven grand. Seven thousand dollars. I tell you, I remember when it was well uh, close to four. And then it's eight thousand on the bracelet if you want the sapphire sandwich, or uh, seventy six hundred for the strap sapphire sandwich. Okay, so uh, nobody nobody should be buying a Hesselite crystal watch. Let's just get that straight. And but nobody that's the NASA agree. one. No, no, that's and the nobody... NASA one. Okay, do you want to just go back to analog mobile phones because that's what they used a while ago? <laughs> Media alert, no one should be buying a Hesselite crystal watch unless they've already got a massive collection and they're just, like, clunting for punishment. So, Sapphire Cover Sandwich... this media. <laughs> Sapphire Sandwich on a bracelet, currently eight grand. What At what date is that going to be a $10,000 watch? Tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, you know what may. i don't think it's gonna take 10 years oh 10 years. Years. Well, definitely I'm reckoning 10 like, years. yeah november 20 I'll, I'll give november 2026 i will come back i feel like there's a countdown clock at omega next to the olympics clock and the countdown clock is when they get to raise their prices next now, let's oh please let's do that let's put at the top of the home page <laughs> for a blog to watch a countdown Number of days till the speed match master reaches ten grand. <laughs> It'd be like one of those accident clocks, you know. We haven't had an ac- a reportable accident for fourteen hundred days. <laughs> we can also have a clock next to it. Number of days since the last new Seiko, and it just stays at zero. <laughs> it stays at zero. Well, <laughs> guess what's it coming have next? A counter. Well, that that handily brings us on to. Played, and to be fair to them, we haven't played it for a while, so. I don't know what they've been doing, but we've maybe just not been covering it. Maybe it's not been media alertish enough. But there are new Seiko Prospects releases. So let's guess the price of the Seiko time. So Seiko Prospects 1965 Heritage Divers Watch. Three varieties, SPB451, SPB453, and SPB455. They're basically mm, prospect-looking divers watches. You can go and have a look at the pictures. So what these are, watch. are the successors to like the SPB 143. I know it's getting crazy with all of the uh, 62 mass derivatives. This is that like SPB 143 version. It is, they've upped the depth rating to 300 meters, put a 430 date window, and then shrunk all of the dimensions. So it's a more compact and wearable design, which took uh, a bit of engineering because they increased the depth rating by 50 meters. So it is the successor to the one SPB one four three, but it is a bit up spec. So I will lay lay yes. the stage for that. So having agreed with Pete last week that as God intended, the date should always be at four thirty. This has been released, and the day at four thirty is truly horrible on this watch. It just doesn't work at all. It's got, they put it in a round window, which you would think wouldn't make that much of a difference, but it really does. It really does make it look. A little bit odd. So huh. Ripley's written the article. I don't know if Ripley's managed in the vast, you know, sway of other things that have been going on to forget what the price of the Seiko was. But Ariel, have a guess at the price of the Seiko. I have seen substantially similar designs for like over three thousand. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I have a feeling this isn't that much. And the way I know that is that it says automatic three days on there. And I don't feel like that's as elegant as they would go for a $3,000 watch. So I'm going to say $2,000. $2,000. Uh, what price do you think, Ripley, I tell you what, what price do you think David would have guessed had he still been on this show, Ripley? Channel yeah. David. Uh, I think he would say that they are getting quite ambitious with the price premiums they're charging for meager upgrades. So he would probably place it significantly higher than the outgoing SPB 143 and its siblings. And he'd probably guess lower than Ariel, but probably is still in the neighborhood of like $1,800. Yeah, well, okay. So the price for this is basically somewhere between 1300 and 1400 depending on the specific spec. It's uh, fourteen hundred for the anniversary model that comes with the extra woven strap. So uh, and so, Omega are charging an extra hundred dollars for lacquer dial, and Seiko are charging an extra hundred dollars for a limited edition and a fabric strap. 
I don't think it's actually a limited edition. It is a special anniversary edition for the 100th anniversary of Seiko watchmaking. So you get the gilt accents and then a strap that's made out of recycled plastic bottles that are woven in such a manner. So it's quite a bit stronger than your average NATO. And it's inspired by Japanese kimono ties or something. I'd like to know in what language (laughs) is automatic three days proper grammar? (laughs) <laughs> Ari was entering the to boldly go and to go boldly debate. <laughs> oh, I did realize that was a bad question. I mean, it's right there in the di- di- You have to look at it all the time. <laughs> yes, let's correct your grammar. It should be three, three day days automatic, automatic. I understand. Not automatic, automatic three, three days. days? <laughs> Please produce a mirror. It's like a weird watch. question. Automatic three days? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Qu- second, second, we need you to put a question mark on the dial uh, <laughs> on this particular <laughs> design of watch. It's just it's it's an open goal for you. Uh, so there we go. I, I mean, it's a pretty watch. Is it thirteen hundred dollars? I mean, they're, they're all very Who wearable. Knows? I just again, like if your budget doesn't allow you to buy forty-seven Seikos a year, wouldn't you just sort of wait and be like, well, I have to look at the many, many, many versions of this watch out there. Do I need that extra day of power reserve? Do I want to sell the old things? Like, I'm just, I want to hear from Seiko owners uh, of some of the recent watches. Like, how do you decide when to buy? And and if something slightly better comes out, do you just sell it and buy the new one? Like, what's the behavior? I'm very curious. Yeah, so a podcast, a blog to watch if you wish to confess your Seiko purchasing addiction (laughs) i think this is a worthy successor to like that one but i can't see anyone dumping a near identical watch and just opting for another one because they needed an extra 100 meters you know i say this in the article that for a company that has so many interesting case silhouettes like the monster the tuna you know the marine master it's crazy how they've honestly just keep remaking various different versions of what's arguably their most generic looking case profile, but clearly that's the one that sells because, you know, could, otherwise they would be doing be, it. Remember the Moser Frankenstein watch? Could there be like a Seiko diver Frankenstein watch where you try to like take all their famous divers and put into one design? I, I did try to get chat GPT to do that for me a few weeks ago, but it's not, that it's, work out? it can't, <laughs> it can't handle it. Can't handle it yet. It's there's too much information. There's too much data from Seiko on the releases for the world's fastest supercomputer to yet handle and produce a uh, a united design. There you go, you stumped AI. Congratulations. That would be <laughs> that would actually be wild if you could make one watch that took every single Seiko release of like the 2023 calendar year and just <laughs> put them into one. I want to see that someone is very good with generative AI graphics and somehow knows how to do this. I would be intellectually very curious to see the result. <laughs> It would just and, be a black screen that would just saturate out. <laughs> the question is, would it look like something else? Would I don't it, know. Would, it, tur- That's the would it turn out that if you put all the Seikos together, it looks like a Moser? Or yeah, the, a- it looks the average like a of all Seiko divers is like a... Like a it's something com- completely peculiar. A, a Panerai, a Luminar, like uh, <laughs> some big bezeled uh, Panerai scuba tech. Uh, Look, nonsense. these these are handsome watches. Like, if you just suddenly popped into Watch Lover Existence right now, and had about you know one to one to, one thousand to fifteen hundred bucks to get like a, a an everyday diver, like you could go way way worse. Like Seiko continues to make a very competent watch. It's not by no means perfect, but again, I it's just so much of the same all the time. It's just way too much media alert for me. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. <laughs> that's what makes it hard. Like. These are objectively really great watches. And if you know that it's a worthy successor to the other one, which was also a great watch, but there's also, yeah. there's too many different things to the point. It's like when you go to a restaurant, like the cheesecake factory and you're like, I don't even know what I'm going to order. I, th- this menu is longer than a dissertation. And I, I don't, I don't even know what style of cuisine I'm looking at right now. You know, it's kind of like that where it's, they have a bit of everything, but they also have so much of just one thing that it makes it impossible to choose. But it's all probably pretty good. And I think these divers are going to be really good at the metal. But it's, you know, why choose this one over any of the other near identical? Seiko, the cheesecake factory of watches for the last hundred years. Media alert. Okay, Ripley, uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, has uh, disturbed us this week uh, in terms of actually recording has been the time zone. I knew I was going to be in a different time zone. And you guys were experiencing daylight savings and 
the hour clock change. And all the rest of it. So actually, you know, you got four watch journalists together to try and decide what time to meet. None of us could decide what time it was actually going to be on the particular Tuesday for recording. But you did send me a message going, you know what, though? My G-Shocks all took care of this for me. So tell us about your G-Shock experience during daylight savings this year. It's not just G-Shock. It's all the Casio. So here's the thing I found interesting. Uh, I woke up. And so Casio seems to use either multiband 6 or Bluetooth or both in their watches. Uh, and all of them kind of seem to grab one, the other, or both. Now, the, um, the ProTrek, the Bonfire, has multiband 6, no Bluetooth. The uh, Coexist GW2100 Bluetooth, no, uh, no multiband 6. And then the Full Metal G has both. All of them reset without any intervention from myself the morning of. So it wasn't like... So well, cool. Yeah, and I think that's cool that all the different technologies did exactly what they were supposed to do, even though that they were, it worked differently. The Bluetooth ones pinged my phone, received the signal. Uh, the other one received some satellite signal. I, I honestly didn't think the multiband six would work, if I'm being completely honest. You know, I, 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 I well, I, you know, I thought You're I would like to take, a, you. Well, like, take a couple nights or put it in the window or something like that. But no, absolutely not. <laughs> it was just in the back of my house, reset itself. I looked at it and went, oh, wait, hold on. Okay, <laughs> well done. So in comparison to that, to what extent are all the electronic other devices like your cooker, your microwave, uh, your clock in your car, to what extent are all of these still showing the wrong time? Or is it just that they've caught up on when you didn't change them last year? That's my car. My car is now accurate again. And that mundane uh -huh. stop to go is going to be wrong for the next six months because they're, I'm <laughs> never resetting that thing again. Because it will take six months to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fluke how it happened the last time I jammed it. You know, when you're like doing something and it clicks and you're like, oh, oh no, but like I'm never going to be able to replicate that. <laughs> That's how I feel now. If I just wait another six months, it'll be bang on time again. Is buying that watch for someone a mean joke? Yes, 100%. <laughs> and then you gift it to them without that little poker. So they have to go find some decrepit pencil or something to or go jab at it. Good luck with this. <laughs> 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 because focused. even with that pin and no instructions you are s-o-l you, you well <laughs> the instructions are digital so what you really do is you just press control print and just hand them that you know. <laughs> we looked at these instructions together they are complicated to say the least well they're complicated and with only one button it's like hold press tap tap press it's like it's worse than entering a code, code on a Game Boy where you're like up, down, left, right, left, right. It's just like hold, press, tap, tap, tap. Morse code style, but Yeah, you know. exactly. It's basically <laughs> like talking to your watch with Morse code. Oh, uh, dear. It's good stuff, good stuff. Well, uh, Ariel, any daylight savings stories? Do we think there's a big thing in the States about getting rid of it? Are the farmers Yes, I just need it to be gone. To it's dumb. So dumb. <laughs> get rid of it around. I like how we vote to shorten the time, but not get rid of it altogether. No one wants this to remain. Just stop it already. We need more daylight, not less. It's insane. Well, you understand it doesn't change what actually happens during the day. There, there is still the same amount of daylight as there's actually going to be, no matter whether you're up or whether you're asleep. I, I understand. It's just like we decide to change the time. It makes no freaking sense. And we make it worse. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's getting dark out. Let's make it faster. Yes, yes. Good stuff. Ripley? Oh, I'm fully, I don't under, I, I feel like every time it comes up, I vote to get rid of it. I've never met a person who's ever been like, you know what? This is a good thing. I like it. It's better for everybody. If, if you want to wake up earlier, set your alarm an hour earlier. Rick, for <laughs> all you farmers who need like the farm dweller, yeah, you set it earlier, you know, but like for and everyone else. why don't they else, just change their clocks? Why can't all the farmers six months for just that decide to come half the again. year? We wake up at 5 a.m. from uh, versus 6 a.m. Can't they just do it themselves? Well, Rick, 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 as a farmer, does it even matter what time you wake up? Isn't it beho aren't you beholden to the days and the sunlight and all of that? Like, does it even matter? Is time relative? Yeah, well, I mean, you realize, I mean, it doesn't matter to any farmer, but we like to tell you that it does because we want you to be inconvenienced. Why should it just be us that's inconvenienced by 
early mornings and the rain and the weather and all the rest of it. We like, you know, give 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 a bit. Because you own huge tracts of, of land. <laughs> Listen, the, just because we own we own this, uh, you know, the 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 means of supply, uh, it does not mean that you all shouldn't have media alert. You all should have to suffer too. <laughs> it's it's our way of bringing balance to the force. Misery loves uh, company, so but please keep the rain exactly. in Scotland. Please keep the rain exactly. in Scotland. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Right. Well, th- this is not a very miserable watch, but uh, with Watches and Wonders coming up, you expect those brands that uh, do not feature so much at Watches and Wonders to start to raise their heads to try and get ahead of the game, or at least get some attention before it all goes the way of the Rolex and the Patek Philippe. So, Audemars Piguet, Royal Oak, Self Winding, Flying Turbion, Open Work, Sand Gold, Media Alert, new type of gold. Uh, sand gold watch do we have any strong thoughts or is just just an ap like most other ap's it looks ap-ish enough and it's a slightly different color and incredibly expensive is there anything really to see here ariel i think it's slightly interesting when there's these mildly different shades of gold to wear i remember a couple years ago when alan gonzone introduced honey gold and they once in a while do it like it's it's lovely it's actually a really nice slightly different color than yellow or rose gold and i remember mont blanc had their lime gold which had something so like is there anything special about this it's just a different alloy but you know it can add a a a very different fashion sense to it uh sometimes these golds don't end up looking very pretty um, I remember Hublot's Magic Gold, which <clears throat> was really about scratch resistance. It was a good job, but it never ended up really looking very nice as gold. It looked a little bit more like bronze. Um, so I-, I think there's reasons why a lot of times they've stuck with sort of like the white gold and the rose gold and the yellow gold. They're like, these are the ones that people mostly like. So it's great to have these flavors, but what we're really seeing is the desire to keep everything the same at Audemars Piguet while also making differences. Right. So that's when you get to when you change sizes, materials, colors, you get to keep everything exactly the same, but have the illusion that you're creating differences. And so that's what we're seeing. Do you think it's more boring to work at Audemars Piguet or Panerai Ripley? Uh, or definitely. No, well, well when, OK. Um, I definitely not got Doxa. the worst single trick pony. Definitely not Doxa. Well, OK. Panerai has two tricks. We, we two tricks, the Radiomir <laughs> and the Luminor, distinct tricks. And then they've got some <laughs> similar tricks with like the Luminor Due and the Submersive. Uh, uh, definitely AP. I I mean, unless you're assigned to the Black Panther or like Spider Man project, like what are you doing every day? You're coming in and being like, this watch in this metal with this color. Okay, <laughs> you know. That's right. and, and so this one, I think the real story here is just the new metal. Uh, I think I I rose gold's cool but i think for as as an everyday piece it can kind of just be a little bit too bright and kind of just like polished copper in many instances um this is supposed to be more muted they've taken out the silver added palladium in um honestly this is one of those things where i can't really comment on it until i see it in the metal it could be lovely or it could just look like weird beige washed out gold um but it all depends on its execution but um I like that they're kind of going this different way. It has the potential to be really cool, but my God, is this watch expensive? Yeah, do we think that there are many $300,000 AP purchasers that want their watch to be muted and subtle? Is, Recent, is recently, kind of mind? Adam RPGA came out with the um, the brown ceramic, or supposed to be a brown ceramic, that was the Travis Scott edition of the Perpetual Calendar. And you know, in the pictures they sent, it was a it was a pretty nice shade of brown. And in person, it wasn't they as nice. I think that it had a bo- more of a of a grayish cast to it because, let's, frankly, it's hard to get sort of a warm color like brown in ceramic. Um, and so I think that's a good point that Ripley makes that you sort of need to see this in person. It could be great, or it could just be another color mm. to say they're doing another color. Well, I just don't know that really, you know, like. Media alert has to focus on that it's a new material. If nothing else could be found in Tracy, other fact, oh yeah, it's a, it's a different material. Rick, they it's launched like fifty watch. watches that day, and this was the most mm. interesting one by far. Okay, like <laughs> I went through all of them, and I chose <laughs> this one. Then, like, this mm. is the headliner. This is the cool story. I, I mean, the John Mayer one was cool, but like, it, it wasn't like Sean said it perfectly from the team. This isn't even the most interesting. 
Audemars Piguet, Royal Oak perpetual calendar in collaboration with a musician in the last six months. That would be the Travis Scott one that Ariel just mentioned. So it's just uh-huh. like, uh, I mean, it, it's a pretty, pretty watch. I, but I thought the rose gold one was cooler, but all the other ones are very much just kind of different sizes and renditions. Um, it's not like they're bad watches in any capacity, but to the untrained eye, I feel like almost any of these models could have already existed in the brand's catalog. And I'm shocked that some of them actually already did. Remember in the early 2000s with the Royal Oak Offshore, every time they did a limited edition with like one of those race car drivers or something like that, they would always change up the watch. Like there'd be a new bezel, there'd be new hands, they'd experiment. And I feel like rather than do race car drivers, they're doing, you know, musicians and stuff today, which is great. But why don't they do that same thing where they say like, Let's do new hands. I mean, the things that they're getting customized or bespoke, I mean, it's 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 almost nothing compared to how bold Audemars Piguet used to be. Yeah, I think of the Terminator AP. Again, a lot of this just existed in the offshore line. I think they're so afraid to change Genta's baby of the Royal Oak that the Royal Oak is just this thing that is just stuck in what it is. And then the offshore gets to have all that fun. But I think of like, the, like Terminator, like the movie Arnold Schwarzenegger, like this enormous watch with these giant like Hannerai style guards over the pushers, like that would never exist today. And like Arnold mentioned, all of those weird private label, like uh, limited editions, race car drivers, you know, Jay-Z, whatever, like all of those were way more interesting than like, here's a jumbo in a different style or something like that. But I would love to see AP kind of get weird again because No, those weren't necessarily the most tasteful watches, but they were definitely interesting. Hmm. Good stuff. Well, go and check out the website. Let us know on the chat if you find this particularly interesting or what your thoughts are on AP in general. Now, we're not going to have a big group of hit miss maybe this week just because internet and things. So it's just going to be an intimate selection for the three of us. So first up, and they were mentioned last week by Alon in the... Uh, same breath as I can't remember, who else were we talking about when we mentioned when he mentioned Bob and Mercy. Bob and Mercy have a watch, the Riviera Tidograph watch. I actually quite like this. This has uh, got a unique take on the moon phase uh, complication. It's got that AP esque vibe whole thing going on. Steel sports watch with some exposed, you know, nuts and bolts. Uh, on the front of it, but for you two gentlemen, is it, we're not even bothered with signs. If you've got them, use them. But uh, Rip plays as a hit, a miss or a maybe for you? Um, I mean, it's a maybe for me. It looks pretty large. I like the idea of it. Um, I would need to play around with it and see exactly how well it implements its complication. But I'm just a big fan of new and novel complications. So a mechanical tide grapher is less seen than like a chronograph or a GMT. So it's a maybe for me. It all depends on its execution. But conceptually, I like it. Yeah, it's a 43 mil watch. So it is on the chunky side. Uh, Ariel, does that make it more appealing to you that it's a bit of a larger hit miss maybe for you? I'm actually going to refer to it as a hit. <clears throat> I've been a fan of the Riviera collection since I think the nineties when it came out and I wanted to come back for a while. Um, you know, it's sort of their geometric case and, and the latest generation has their, you know, their five day power reserve automatic movement, which is actually a pretty decent movement at not too expensive a price. Um, I agree that the technical innovation here is more of a, a trick and the way that it's sort of dressed as opposed to like really something new. Uh, but it is a way of making the moon phase maybe a little bit more relevant, especially for a sports watch. Um, so I think they could have got a, you know a lot worse. We've seen much worse Rivieras that they've come out with over the last couple of years after they've relaunched it. So um, I, I actually you know would would be happy wearing this watch, and it's sort of that fun thing where you want to go to the beach or something like that to you know see the tide the, the tide graph in action. And for me, that's the hallmark of a good sports watch is it sort of gives you a drive to go do that thing uh, that it's designed to do with it. Yes. Yeah, that's an interesting point. It is a bit expensive. It feels like five grand for anything with Bomber Mercy on it. But that's seems, the new three grand. Seems, now, obviously, we've, we've determined stretch. that, Five right? grand is a new three grand. It is. It's the watch, watch industry. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I always feel the case back here. I imagine it's because the movement is small but the case back windows in Riviera's always seem to be a bit they remind me of ball watches 
where they always seem a bit small in the back. Like the aperture seems disproportionately small in relation to the, the if you like, the rear bezel, uh, which always seems to have quite a lot of uh, real estate on it. I don't know if it's just because the, the movement they use is naturally small, but they've put it in a bigger case. This doesn't have a have a date complication on it, so you can't really tell from looking at it as to, you know, is it just a titchy little movement in the back, in the uh, behind uh, this dial? But it's, it's it's an attractive watch. I'd, I'd give it a hit, maybe leaning towards the maybe just because of the price, but uh, certainly well worth a look. I something very different, and you should go and check out this watch if for no other reason in the comment section, because the creator of this watch has chosen rightly so to engage with the comments and this is a watch review of the mid-century modern is it pronounced moles or moels in co 528 rectangular watch do we know no i will no. defer to anyone else on this one <laughs> so we're going to call it the moles watch or the Mo and i feel like moels what does what does the wee two dots above an o make it make it sound like i don't know <laughs> I'm Scottish with moles. I'm going for moles. Going for moles. So I actually really like this. So for me, this would be be a hit. It does look like it might be a bit jaggy if you happen to, for some reason, need to do press ups with this watch on. I think you're that that little bit of your the back of your palm, back of your hand may suffer. Does somewhat. moles not say sport to you, Rick? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't strike me that this is the watch you're wearing on your commando assault course. But I do rather like it. I think it it works quite well as a kind of you know landscape uh, landscape watch. Ripley, what do you think? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I I like it without kind of inexplicably. You know, it's it, it's. I yes. think it's just because it's different. You know what I mean? It's just different. I don't think. It looks particularly refined as far as the case shape or dimensions, but the fact that it is different um, and it, the fact that they're kind of using very geometric lines to do something asymmetric, I find also interesting. Same reason I like the Poprov. When something's fluid and asymmetric, you know, it's just kind of amorphous, but when it's angular and asymmetric, it looks very intentional. And so you get this kind of weird elongated TV case, these lines running through the dial, and then yet it's this kind of oblong thing with the, you know, the actual display allocated off to the right side of the case. So, yeah, I like it just because it's different. I feel like it shouldn't work, but it does. And mm. just on that merit alone, and it's not terribly expensive. So, yeah, on that merit no, alone, it's, it's I'll say it's a hit. Eight, 820 quid, a bit more for some other model variants. Ariel, this appeal? I think what we're all surprised at is that it sort of works aesthetically. Like it's it's like in our minds, like it shouldn't work, but it does. Mm. And that's sort of the beauty of it. Um, it you know, I, I agree from a fashion perspective, it's handsome. Like it's just different enough to call attention to it, but it's not like crazy weird. It's like, what's that insane thing on your wrist? And that's the type of look that I think a lot of people like to go for, you know, um, so I think I think it's I think it's a hit in that regard. I don't know that I personally would have a lot of occasions to wear a watch like this, but I would enjoy seeing it on others. So for me, it's a maybe, but I, I think it's a great watch. Yeah, I think this is a, a price point whereby if if watch collecting is your thing, you're maybe buying this, and and this is kind of like your red bar watch of interest. You can't really think of it any other time you'd wear it, unless you're around other watch geeks just to show them the cool thing. Uh, it's clearly a sign of really great design that the constituent parts, which maybe we all think on paper wouldn't work, actually do. I, I would be interested to see it offset, so actually not mounted in the middle, but mounted towards the crown, so that more of it is up your arm rather than down towards your wrist to see if that, you know, that the, the strap was mounted in line with the 12 and 6. And it was actually offset, a bit like a kind of pro cloth, uh, uh, kind of kind of vibe. But yeah, uh, very much uh, worth a look. Uh, finally, a, a brand who I think it's fair to say I produced something maybe we didn't expect. Uh, Ripley, you have reviewed this. This is the Schofield Light General Purpose Field Watch. Did you actually you got a chance to handle this? What did you I think? did? Because I did the pictures I saw of it really nice. Yeah, I did. I so 
it's so hard to separate watches from their prices and in a vacuum devoid of any price um it, you know i think it's a i think it's a hit it's a very charming piece there's a lot it does right um some of the proportions are a bit awkward where's a, lar a bit larger than it is uh the fact that it has a gmt movement it's the nh34 from seiko um but doesn't have any type of 24 hour marking so you just kind of have to approximate it's kind of like more of an amp indicator than anything else um, you know, it, it, I feel like it could have been just as successful of a watch without that detail and then just a three-hander at a lower price point, maybe. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't really compare this with the NH34 to like a Seiko GMT, uh, Seiko 5 GMT that uses the same movement. Um, just economies of scale and, you know, even the packaging's, you know, very interesting on it. But it is, it, it, it's, it's so expensive for the price that it's, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. Uh, but, you know, by itself, I think it's a really cool piece. It's a hit, but I don't know if this is actually where I'd be putting my money because it is like almost Tudor money. Hmm. Haru? It's funny, like, I, I didn't realize what watch he was talking about, and I was, like, trying to guess what it was, and I couldn't, <laughs> based upon his, <laughs> his explanation. Was this the show field? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. The, the, the thing that comes to mind immediately is you're going to be asked to spend a lot. Um, I don't know why they need to charge so much. I think this is the type of watch that probably looks more interesting on the wrist than off the wrist. Off the wrist, it looks sort of like a a weird proportionally weird proportion to set of, you know, curves and things like that. But I think it's a little bit more elegant probably on the wrist. And hopefully it's not too big. Um, I think the problem is, you know, when I look at something like this, when Ripley looks at something like this, we know that the competition in this space is really, really tight, really, really, really tight. <clears throat> and when we see something at this price point. We're like, so this isn't for watch collectors. Like this is priced for something, some, somebody else. Um, so I, I I I like I like the design ethos of this brand, but I'd like to know who per se they're selling to because they're far and away not related to the value proposition. Like they're not trying to sell the people that like know what the competition is, right? Yeah, and that's and, and so like obviously I think in cars it's more common for people to not to be able to separate the end package of the car and its price point from just the engine in it. Cause you, you know, you'll have Toyota engines and Lotuses and you obviously it's been dressed up and it's a very different engine at the end of the day. But in this, for watches, it's a little bit, you can regulate a movement short of like really doing like a, a Rolex to the Zenith, uh, El Primero. You're not totally overhauling it. Uh, this is mm -hmm. an example where if I think, if I think if it was powered by just some three handed Swiss movement, people would say less about the price. But just the fact that it's powered by the NH34, which you can find in watches down to a few hundred dollars, I think that's the mental sticking point. But if you just threw some random freehand Salita in this, I think people go, oh, two grand Swiss movement, you know, very well considered small production. You know, there's only 150 pieces in each colorway. I think that'd be a much easier pill to swallow. And like I said in, in the article, I don't think it needed to be a GMT. So that would have been just fine. If I say the word Sab. What does that make you think of in relation to this watch? Like the car? Car? Yeah, because I'm looking at this going, yeah, but please, like relating this to cars, I'm thinking, this is, this is a Saab. It, it looks like it's got something about it, but actually it's just... You're talking a, about a, the really underpowered engine? I hear you. <laughs> yeah. but you. But you know the paint's never going to chip, and it will still be alive like an old Defender 40 years from now. Yeah, the case will like crack in half. half. You got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really like this. I, I'm, I'm not too. Um, maybe it's just an underappreciation of the, the number of really cheap watches that this movement appears in. For like for that money, quid. did they only supply one buckle that you had to move back and forth? Yes. So <laughs> so here it comes with both straps. They're lovely. For they're from their sister company, and they have this uh, nice thing that kind of keeps the two keepers together, which is really cool. But and it's a really well conceived buckle, but it comes with a little screwdriver because you have to you have to swap the buckles and but they're quick release at the lugs, so it's like you can pull it off so quick and then you need the screwdriver to complete the action. And I love how the screwdriver was somehow less expensive than just another buckle. Well, <laughs> the buckle actually the buckle is uh donated from the uh, the brand's obscura model, which is like their most expensive model. 
So it's got, it's sort of interesting that it, it's in, it's got out to be the the least expensive entry level watch, and then they've they've taken the buckle from their most expensive watch, and that's probably the reason why they weren't anchoring. Just out of curiosity, too. what makes this buckle so fancy that it could only be on an expensive watch? I mean, it, it it looks very well engineered. The thing screws in. It looks multiple parts. I listened to the podcast for, for to write the article where he spoke about it. Um, and it, it, when you see it in, the, in person, it, it's kind of impressive. But like at the same time, it's not so impressive to the point where like I wouldn't rather just have two buckles. He had a podcast about the buckle. Like what? Goes no, no, no. In? About, I'm, I'm just curious about the design point. about the design process on the watch. But he briefly mentioned the buckle. And so I, you know, I'm like, okay, it came, it, it came, it came from the, it came from the most you expensive. <laughs> uh, well, go and check. Just give check him two buckles. Out. Yeah, I think that would seem to make eminent sense. Two buckles, please. It'd be a limited edition. You get two. Buckles. I mean, look, if it was like a three hundred dollar watch, I get it. But this is like over two thousand dollars. Like, you know, it clearly the money didn't go into the movements. Okay. That is very yeah. much true. That's Although the case true. back is kind of cool. The case back is, uh, I, I like how there's... Okay, it has a $1,000 case back. I'll forget it. <laughs> the $2,000 <laughs> case back, Earl. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, I can now provide a media alert because it would appear, as was briefly chatted about in our little WhatsApp group, uh, Cam, uh, who you may know from the Tribe Watches podcast, has been on here uh, at least once, maybe twice of the show of the past, has reported that as well as the launch of the new Speedmaster, the 42mm Snoopy appears to have been discontinued quietly in the background, as I believe he was on a waiting list for one, so you ain't getting a new 42mm Snoopy, it appears they're all gone. So does that mean that this is the only white dialed Speedmaster in that range. Wait, the Snoopy which Snoopy? Speed. The 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 most so recent. So the the one I think it's the one with the the animation on the back. Oh, you know, the, the silver with the dog blue registers. And the rocket or whatever it is. Well, that makes sense. They got to clear that one out so they can do the Swatch <laughs> Omega Snoopy that will inevitably ah. be coming out. So out with the old and with the new bioceramic. <laughs> so bioceramic Snoopy, here we come, hey, gentlemen. You're beginning to. Uh, wind up prepare for watch and wonders it's not that far away it'll be soon uh, it's very soon in creeping in uh, ario i assume you're heading off to geneva uh, earlier than the normal watch and wonders date that tends to be your strategy catch up with a few people first is there much expected in the lead up to watch and wonders well i can say that when we're there without trying very hard we could easily have over a hundred meetings with brands like that that's that's a very conservative estimate. So <clears throat> we're going to try to see as many of these companies beforehand. I have somebody coming to my house tomorrow where I can shoot some watches that we would otherwise have to shoot in Geneva. So um, David right now is is doing a preview. Other members of the team will be doing previews. So we'll be getting a little bit of an ability to see some of the watches in advance, uh, which is great. But the show is going to be our our mountain climbing marathon <laughs> of watches all week um and the way we prepare as i suggest to everyone is a, a physical training just climbing a mountain every day <laughs> get your get your 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 uh, mouse button pre-programmed to get rid of all the media alerts that will come out uh, in <laughs> advance uh, ripley expectations let's have an early prediction who what brand's going to surprise us the most and which one are we going to be most disappointed by I think we're going to be surprised by Rolex. I think okay. th I think they've been a little bit offended <laughs> that we. I think I think we've they've gotten a little <laughs> bit offended that we've been calling them boring for years, and I think that they're now look at look at last year they did some interesting stuff uh, that you wouldn't expect, very uncharacteristic of Rolex. I think that trend's going to continue for another year. Now, surprising for Rolex is like not surprising, but like. So we, they will surprise us. I think that will be a thing. Um, who will we be underwhelmed by? Oh, lots. Um, I, I, I mean, we think about it proportionally. Like if Bob and Mercy don't have a great, nobody's going to be like that surprised that they're not the darling of the show. But there are obviously watch brands that hope to be the darling of the show. And who's going to drop the ball the most? I don't know, probably whoever's been talking it up the most, you know what I mean? Some brands, you know, they, they like really, they don't want to tell you what it is, but they're like, but 
Jeep and ear to the ground. It's going to be great. We really only do a couple like big novelties a year. This is going to be one of them. And if it isn't, you know, like at that always is like, oh, I've got like four starred emails in my inbox about this. And this is what you put forward. All right. <laughs> there are certainly obviously what's one of this growing. It's taking a step up in terms of growth in the number of brands there this year. Brightwing are there. The likes of Bremen, it sounds like you're taking something in the main concourse, not like in the little... The, the little section there's a couple other brands there's obviously a new area being opened i've not seen the layout of the place yet i don't know if you gents have seen a map they have a it's hall too of, now yeah so it's it's going to take a step up and obviously because you have a hall two you're going to know whether you've been put in hall one or hall two so it's it's now no longer the little tight parade where all, all the little brands kind of gather but it's in the center of everything now you're very much i don't know you're a brand that you get to go to hall two you 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 don't get to go to Hall One, so it'll be interesting to see who's been relegated. Ariel prediction: When you where are you going to first? Like who's who you want to see the most, or are you that weathered by the whole thing? You really don't care anymore. I like the tradition where we go to Rolex first. This uh-huh. is this goes back from the Basel World days, where Rolex. <laughs> I don't even think they still do this anymore. But they literally had little like drapes that they put on the on the watches. <laughs> they pull them off uh-huh. at a specific moment. It wasn't when the show started. It was after the show started. Like it was like noon or something like that. And people would gather around, and <clears throat> I guess for the sake of tradition, we like going over to Rolex first and and seeing what they have. For us, it makes a lot of sense because obviously there's, it's a big news. You know what's new for Rolex. So we it's like it's like the first day we're like okay. Cover what's new at Rolex. Tudor got anything interesting? Maybe something at Patek. Do any other brands have anything worth noting? And then we have to like write that stuff up right away. And then everything else, it's not that it's not important. It's just not like absolute top priority. We got to write about it right now. Um, so that's really the ri- the ritual for us. And then going to the question about what do I expect? Um, there are going to be some crazy watches at the show this year, and I'm excited by that. I can't say who they're going to be from necessarily. It's going to be a mix, some little brands that you you know that have to do stuff like that, and even some big brands that you wouldn't expect need stuff to come from. I don't think we're going to see it from the Rolex group, uh, which is the, <laughs> the group now, which you know also includes Tudor and then Carla Bucherer. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of commercial stuff from them. Rolex mm-hmm. now is like trying to excite everyone with like one weird watch a year maybe two but it, it's just back to the formula right they have like a list of like 50 of them they just choose all right which one do we want to do this year um mm-hmm. so it's sort of like a, a it's it's a highly calculated thing and i think that we get more excited by the true surprises and there's never going to be true surprises from the rolex group and having experienced the chanel boutique you know having experienced the chanel booth with your good self last year who will have the grumpiest stand in uh who will be the most unwelcoming welcoming watch brand <laughs> and watches and wonders this you know year? it's funny you mentioned that um i was with the folks um you know from lvmh recently and they confirmed the rumor that i i thought it was a rumor because it seemed kind of crazy but when Bernard Arnault walked the Richemont section of the show last year, um, I won't disclose who, even though I'm pretty sure I think I know who it is, ordered the Richemont brands to rope off their booths and not allow Mr. Arnault to walk in. He could just look in and get what he wants to see. Um, and a lot of CEOs apparently walked to him and said, I'm so sorry, sir. This is rude and unprofessional, but I was asked to do this. Nice. Um, so people who have to do stuff like that, you know, they tend to be grumpier, right? Like that's, that's not, it's not a very feel good type of thing you have to do. So if stuff like that continues, mm-hmm. those are going to be the surlier folks to meet at the show. So anyone with the name Arno. No, he's fine. It's the people who have to institute orders like don't let the enemy in, right? Because the whole uh-huh. the whole thing about Basel World, which I think I loved, is even though these brands were fierce competitors, it they all pretended to sort of be like on the same side. Like we're just in it for watches, right? We love watches. We're here to support one another. But Watches of Wonders truly is now having like lines drawn, like different halls. They can't be next to me. Don't let their people in. Now that like the true emotion is coming out a little bit. Um and and us as media, we're just gonna be bystanders. We get to sit back and watch all the weird drama unfold, and hopefully, it's entertaining. 
I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will. Well, thank you very much for all tuning into this week's show. Uh, apologies in advance if any technical issues end up working their way out when we check the quality of this recording uh, for myself and David. So we'll see. So hopefully there is a show. Uh, but thank you very much for tuning there in. Better Final be a show. Th- yeah, better be a show. Uh, Final thoughts, Ripley, to leave us with? About what? Uh, I have so many thoughts all the time. I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay, so Ripley, give us your most random thoughts in your head right now to leave us with. <laughs> Uh, is loom edible? Like, like, is like, it... like the like like the super luminova itself. Like, obviously, it's this kind of the ceramic powder they put in the the they put it into they powderize it and then they mix it with like epoxies and that's what we think of as super luminova. But the actual ceramic compound is that edible? Is it toxic? Like, could I eat a cap? Edible. Of it and... <laughs> yeah, I hear that word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I'm curious if I could eat it. <laughs> like, not not when it's mixed in with glue, but like in its powdered. Like pure, you know, super luminal form. If you put it in your mouth and swallow it, you can eat just about anything. The question is, will you survive? <laughs> That's right. Well, it, I'm just saying, if it's totally eat. non-toxic and you put it into the dog's food, and then the people who left their dog's mess during the day, it would charge up in the sunlight, and then you'd see it, and you wouldn't <laughs> step on it at night. It's absolutely brilliant, but this is all contingent <laughs> on it being non-toxic. So, you know, we're thinking. <laughs> this doesn't seem very random. It seems like you've been thinking about this a lot. Yeah. Oh no no no! This is this is literally what I just started thinking about right now. So we, if yeah, we want to. I I think we need to play this game later. more often. We just we just we just give Ripley, Ripley tell us what's in your head right now. It's like when women ask you what are you thinking about, and you don't want to confess that what you're thinking about is I don't know train sets or uh, watches train, train sets. Or, or nothing. Like it is possible. <laughs> it is possible just to sit there and go. Oh, I'm actually genuinely thinking about nothing. <laughs> So, or do you anyway, own a train set? I, I don't actually. I feel like I should do, though. I, I feel like, like I it, in set. the 80s is when it ended where <laughs> men would have train sets as their hobbies. Like, apparently, that was the cutoff. But yes, for a long time, a lot, a lot of movies are like, what are you doing, sir? I'm thinking about playing with my trains. <laughs> what if you put a big, like a giant train set, like a wee one you could ride around your property? Like Walt Disney? Yeah, I think that's a stunning idea. There, there used to be one of them near where I live now that closed and was defunct many moons ago. But if it just so happens that the track and train still exist in a shed somewhere, then do reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll put that on the farm. And then the rest of the bug watch team can come and have a wee shot. On the I want to see Rig riding around his model train with his ball train master watch on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to say, yeah, you're going to need to deck it out in ball railroad crowd. You get, get them on Dane clocks. Oh, that'll be good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A, a, a watch theme train set. It's, 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 clearly a, it's clearly a story. He's got that has pocket yet to watches be coming out of like everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> what other, what, so, ball watches, mundane, any other particularly train related watch brands at spring? And we're going to start calling you conductor. You know, some people are called captain I or conduct, admiral. Sure, we're yes, start like conductor. I'm going to change my cards from producer to conductor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why doesn't ball include a little toy train? Like Panerai includes a submarine in some of their watches. There you, there you can get uh, your watch and your train set all in one package. R- R- Everyone at ball right fire. now is like, Oh my God, we should have been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Ripley, you're not supposed to give these ideas away for free into the public realm. The ball Thomas the tank engine your- collab. <laughs> 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 it's what everyone's waiting for. Watching what our ball at watches and wonders. I don't know. Thomas the Tank Engine. Anyway, on that nonsense, we will leave the show for this week. Uh, tune in again next week. Have a great week. Cheerio. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Dinner.